Welcome to my latest YouTube video. Today I'm doing something a little bit different. Instead of talking about a new idea, a concept, something that I think can make a big difference in the lives of folks suffering from self-love deficit disorder, codependents who struggle with narcissistic abuse, narcissist gaslighting, you know, the stuff that I normally talk about. I decided to go back and look at some of my older videos and look for some gems that needed to be revisited. And I did find such a gem, such a wonderful video, and it was a collaboration video that I did with Meredith Miller. This was done about three years ago when Meredith probably on her YouTube channel had less than, um, I'm guessing, a thousand subscribers um, and uh, maybe less than um, a half a million views. And now she's just a tremendous force out there with over uh, 20 million views and incredible amount of subscribers. She's written three books. She is a, uh, a holistic healer. She creates incredible amount of topical information for healing trauma, narcissistic abuse, codependency. She actually has this wealth of information um, done in Spanish also. So I went back to, to the video that we did three years ago and I, I completely went through it and looked for the pieces that I thought were still relevant and decided to kind of polish it up and re-offer it to you guys. I hope you like it. And I thank you once again, Meredith. You are just a ray of sunshine. You are an awesome force in this healing community. Keep up the great work. Hi, Roz. Thank you so much for being here and taking time today to do this interview for my YouTube channel. Oh, I am delighted. You know what? I have to be honest. Um, I have watched a lot of videos um, on narcissism and codependency. And Meredith, I kind of accidentally came across yours. And it just kind of blew me away. You were like talking about the human magnet syndrome, the stuff that I write about in a way that like, like you kind of wrote it with me. And I kind of like, as soon as I like, saw your video, I thought, man, I want to meet this person. She really not only knows my stuff, of course, which is everyone want, you know, every writer wants to hear that. <laughs> but what I liked most about it was you put your own perspective, your own narrative, and your own opinions on it, and, and you expanded it. I was just delighted that we started to get to know each other and knew that we would make a great video together. So, so, so thank you. Well, I did read your book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, which is a fantastic book. You know, if anybody hasn't read that yet, I highly recommend getting it because you know, you really explain in this book just the dynamic that goes on between the emotional manipulator and the codependent. And that's so key to understand, you know, and you line up the continuum of self. And I think it's really helpful for people to read that and see, like, where are they falling on there? And where do they actually want to be? You know, where do they want to move toward? And um, it's just fantastic. And then I read the dedication of your book, which was about finding true and healthy love after codependency, you know, with this partner of your dreams and also the relationship that you have with your son and the realization you had that, you know, these dysfunctional and transgenerational patterns don't have to keep going, that you could end the legacy of abuse, you could end it for you, you could end it for your son and for all future generations, you know, coming. So I wanted to talk today about the topic of seeking true and healthy love after narcissistic abuse. Because I think so many people are asking this question. I often hear people say, you know, like, will I ever find true love? Or how will I even recognize true love if it shows up again? And, you know, that was my own question, too. And I mentioned to you earlier that, you know, I had discovered your YouTube channel almost two years ago after leaving the last Covert Narc. And I was just distraught asking myself, like, how didn't I realize it? Like, I really felt like it felt so right. How was my intuition so wrong? And then I heard your voice say, there is no relationship that feels so right as that between a narcissist and a codependent. And it just blew my mind. And, you know, the really empowering thing that I got out of this book that you wrote is that everything changes when the codependent gets healthy. And that was so empowering because I realized it's not just about that person. It's not like I'm a victim to these people that show up. Like, what can I do to change myself 
so that I don't keep attracting this in my life so that that ends and you know that was really empowering in your book so you know I wanted to ask you because you obviously have the wisdom of experience like you are a success story and also to give hope and faith to people listening to this that it is possible to find healthy and true love you know and what are some steps that they can take what are some things they could work on what are some ways that they can look for and recognize that when it does show up in their life and I would love to hear what you have to say on this topic I really appreciate your affirmation and validation of my work but I want to promise you that it's ongoing and it doesn't stop um, because what I teach now more than ever is that Codependency, which I now refer as self-love deficit disorder, is a problem of the lack of self-love. Codependency, or SLDD, um, can be traced back to some very painful moments in our life, um, our childhood, when we were raised by a harmful narcissistic parent, and that impacted us so deeply, it created this relationship template that automatically guides us to the type of person that feels familiar. When you feel safe and familiar with someone, it, it exponentially increases the attraction level. And that's the chemistry. And I was able to figure it out that it was the trauma of, of, not, of what happened to me as a child. That I was carrying around those wounds um, of not being good enough, always feeling I'm lost in a world of a narcissist. And once I started to isolate that my codependency or self-love deficit disorder was connected to trauma, that is when I started to dig, dig deep in all the psychotherapy I can get. And one layer at a time, my life changed. I had to connect the cause of the problem to the problem. I was falling in love with harmful people, magnetically attracted to them because it somehow felt, and then this is the paradox, it felt safe and familiar. Right. A codependent somehow, they, and I, I can feel this and think about it, I can remember this. When you meet a narcissist for the first time and, and then there's physical chemistry and attraction, there's this like you can, you want to help them and you want to save them. It's just like it feels so intensely familiar and you get lost in that and that's where it all begins. That's born out of your attachment trauma and your unresolved wounds. That's kind of where I started in my own journey to try to figure it out to eventually be a partner into a healthy relationship. How long did it take you from that point where you had the realization to when you were like truly ready to meet your ideal mate? <laughs> it's kind of funny because it's, it's actually a very timely question. I remember after I divorced my son's mom, who I refer to as my ex-wife, <laughs> X, X, X1, we had X1 and X2. Okay. <laughs> and we're not talking superheroes. <laughs> um, and I don't hold any malice for them anymore. I went into therapy with a therapist named Jill Mailing. The miracle of, of that therapy is she, she uh, we were talking about the, my relationship with my parents, and I was getting really annoyed. I'm thinking, why is she so Freudian? It's like, it's not always about parents. I just want to talk about my feelings. And she kept, and she goes, and then she says, have you read this book, um, the, um, the Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller? And she goes, you should read it. Um, and oh my God, it changed my world. It was, and, and um, I get goosebumps. She never mentioned codependency, but it explained why people like me fall in love with narcissists, because they're replicating the pattern they learned as a child in taking care of the narcissistic parent. And it was like, bam, this explains it. And it was like some of the greatest therapy. And I thought I was done, I thought I was good. About a year later, I met a woman, fell deeply in love. We were soulmates, uh, got married quickly. Almost as six months later, she changed into a person who was, I believe, was horribly narcissistic and neglectful to the relationship. And that, I was in that marriage three years, and then we divorced. 
and I went back into therapy. And I was humiliated. I was, I mean, because I'm a therapist, for God's sake. You know, I like, I'm, you know, I'm like going to therapy, proving everyone that, you know, I practice what I preach. But I just did the same thing. And that's when I, with I, like a supercharged battery pack on my back, that is when I said, I am not, I am not stopping until I figure this out. And that's when I went even deeper into my trauma and my wounds and the connections. And that's about the time when I started to realize I was so, so lonely. I had so much loneliness inside of me my whole life. And I started to connect to the depth of despair that I had in the background always. And once I realized I didn't feel lonely when I was with a narcissist, but it was horrible, but I felt so horribly, what I now call pathologically lonely, when I was by myself, I started to realize that the loneliness is the problem. I have to solve the loneliness. So you heard my whole story. You would, you'll see that every part of my story, I created another element that would become a part of the human magnet syndrome because um, everything that happened in my life and my family of origin, just my desire to figure it out in therapy helped me figure something out that I would eventually make it into my book. And something shifted. Once I solved the loneliness, I noticed that I started to make better choices in relationships. I wasn't so compelled to want to help people who didn't want to be more mutual in a relationship. Do you have any questions about what I've said so far, which started off with identifying the attachment trauma and the connection to that, and then which took, um, took about a year or two, and then figuring out the connection of loneliness and pathological loneliness? Yeah, I totally agree with all of that, and I see the validity there for sure. And I think, you know, you talked about that inner child wound of loneliness. I realized that was my wound, too. Like, I had to drink ayahuasca to figure that out, to recognize that was the wound. And I think that's the key for people to recognize, is what is that inner child wound? Like, what was that feeling that they had growing up? Because that's what creates that emptiness and that void, that, like, we're seeking something, someone to fill that outside of ourselves, which is why we find the narcissist and the manipulators, you know, and instead we have to turn that inward. So people ask me a lot too, you know, like, so how do you deal with that loneliness? Like, how do you feel that loneliness yourself versus looking outside of yourself? You, can, you, you actually can't. You can't solve the loneliness by dealing with the loneliness as a problem itself. I have a pyramid. As you can see on this SLDD diagram, codependency is a mere symptom of not loving oneself. Codependency is not what needs to be treated. Rather, the root cause needs to be addressed. It all begins with attachment trauma, the root cause. This often occurs when a child is raised by a narcissistic parent who does not allow them to feel loved, respected, cared for, and safe. Love is merely conditional and judgmental. This trauma is then responsible for causing core shame. Core shame is a distorted belief of being fundamentally bad or flawed. Such toxic shame reduces a person to feeling only good when they take care of others while ignoring themselves. Loving someone while being invisible creates pathological loneliness, deep, bone-aching emotional pain. This is the excruciating SLDD addiction withdrawal pain that reduces one to feeling invisible, worthless, and unlovable. The pain of it is simply unbearable. Hence, the person with SLDD is uniquely prone to SLDD addiction, which is the desperate need of a relationship that will make the lonely pain go away. The pathologically narcissistic romantic interest becomes their drug of choice, which never remedies their loneliness and lifelong pursuit of love, respect, and caring. Like other addictions, the attraction to narcissist begins with euphoria and excitement, but predictably ends with regret and shame. This attachment traumatized, shame-based, pathologically lonely, narcissist-addicted person behaves with self-love deficit disorder, the selfless, 
compulsive caretaker who habitually attempts to control others into loving them. Therefore, the problem was never the SLDD, but everything that lies beneath it. The pyramid demonstrates why someone with SLDD does not respond to traditional psychotherapy, as the problem that is treated is not the actual cause of the disorder. This invisible and treatment-resistant addiction cannot be remedied unless its underlying causes are addressed and solved. So, the, a lot of therapy is superficial and symptom-based. It doesn't work. This is why I'm writing the codependency cure is because I want to give people instruction on how to solve this horrible problem of self-love deficit disorder. That's fantastic. And you're totally right, because when you love yourself, it's so obvious when someone else isn't loving you, right? When you respect yourself, it's so obvious when someone else isn't respecting you. Absolutely. It's so simple. I, I couldn't believe it when I figured it out. <laughs> that, that the antidote to, um, to codependency is self-love. Now, it's not like, okay, now I know it. I love myself. Right. Why, why, narcissists go away. No, I wish, or please look in the mirror and say I love myself 12 times, um, not 13 or not 10, <laughs> but <laughs> 12. No, none of that works is you have to figure out what's blocking you, and that is the trauma that is hard to get to because it's so painful. Right, and that trauma only survives in the darkness and in what's hidden, so when we bring that into the light, it already starts to change and transmute and become something else. Yes. Actually, um, it reminds me of a saying that I once quoted, um, shame only survives in the dark. What is your experience in working with trauma and its connection? When I get to the opportunity to work ongoing with people, then we get to work deeper into the trauma. And so my focus is on the wholeness, on the holistic side. So creating that whole experience again, that's the trauma is like the separation, the fragmentation of the soul. In shamanism, they would see it as a fragmentation of the soul. But it's also a disconnection. And I think like that's the source of that loneliness and all of that. And so we can go deep into that wound. So like, in, I know psychology goes to like the inner child wound. And then in shamanism, we go a little beyond that as well into the mm -hmm. perinatal and the prenatal and then the transpersonal realms. But when we can get that person to experience that sense of wholeness, it's like everything starts to come together, that healing starts to begin again because the trauma starts to disappear. It just dissolves in the light of awareness and love. So even in your own perspective, um, even though it differs from mine, but the similarities is that the codependency or the attraction the narcissist is a representation that something is not right in um, the way that you view the world and your connection to the world, whether it's um, uh, an existential connection, um, a, a metaphysical connection, or a psychological connection. Totally. And we have to figure out um, a way to find out what is inhibiting that um, connection um, or causing the disconnection, and we get to trauma, and you through your your methods and me through my methods, we allow people to finally get a chance to be who they were always meant to be, um, to experience um, what I believe is a God-given right to be happy right. and to love yourself. Right. That's the amazing thing about trauma is that the very nature of trauma is transformative, and I think so much you know, when we're in it and we can't see out of it, all we see is the negative of that. You know, nothing will ever be the same, but nothing will ever be the same. So if we can look at that in a positive way and look at that experience as some sort of blessing to be able to extract some kind of treasure therein and then allow that to change our lives some way, to create a new purpose, to create new passion, new meaning in life, then it's totally worth everything we went through. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and I... I imagine you do fantastic work. People are looking for quick answers. Right. And there's a lot of YouTube videos of angry people talking about narcissism. And there's a lot of people out there who are narcissists or covert narcissists. And I'm not going to, every time I say this on a video, people say, who are you talking about? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> but they're, they're out there 
and they're on this bandstand uh, out there, you know, saying, you know, stand up for yourself and, and attack back and, you know, and, and fight back. And, um, and then there's a lot of people who are really wounded who are sharing their story. And all of these videos have value right. because they're in formation. Um, but what they don't do, and they never will do, um, is they won't solve the problem. The problem isn't the narcissist. Right. And that's why my book changed the discussion. The problem is we, so, um, SLDs or codependents, we are attracted to narcissists for a reason that we don't even know. And although we're never responsible for the pain and the abuse or the neglect that they cause, we are responsible for um, entering into that relationship and staying in it. And I teach my, I teach um, whether it's my YouTube viewers, my seminar um, participants, or my clients, is that as long as you want to blame the narcissist and come up ways to um, fight back, you are in their net still. Yeah. The only solution is to find out what compels you to try to get something that you can never get from a person that will never give it to you. Why did that start? And that's the cure. Right, because anything less is just keeping you stuck in the victimhood where there's always the blame for someone else. And yeah, the narcissist had the responsibility in that for the abuse. But what's funny is if you know you look at, well, where did they come from? And why are they like they are? And you just keep going. It's like this endless game of dominoes. And who started it? And who started this game? We have no idea. Like, who's really to blame? It just keeps happening until someone stands up and says, it ends with me, it stops right now, I'm gonna end this pattern by taking care of me. It's the only thing I have control over is me. Absolutely, and then the taking care of me transmutes into the falling in love with self. Right. When you fall in love with yourself, and it sounds kind of corny, especially a guy saying it, <laughs> <laughs> is you start to fall in love with yourself. It is the coolest experience because it, 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 it follows the healing and the resolution of the trauma. And you just like start to like enjoy things that just for you. While well, you go to a dinner by yourself or see a movie by yourself or you disagree with people and, and you think it's funny and you're not, up, you're not mad. And you just, it is, the, it is a wonderful experience that is self-perpetuating. It builds upon itself and you can't stop it which is why I not only changed um, codependency to self-love deficit disorder, but I decided not to have the term recovering SLD, self-love deficient. I wanted to not have a negative stigma, even on my new term that has less stigma. So I created self-love abundant. Oh, I love it. So, and, and if you look at the pyramids, There is, however, a cure for self-love deficit disorder. You may have guessed it. The cure is the achievement of self-love abundance. This is the exact opposite of each of the SLDD pyramids levels, such as demonstrated in the self-love abundance pyramid. First, the root of the problem is addressed. Attachment trauma resolution occurs when a person in psychotherapy safely explores their repressed or hidden childhood trauma. By bringing their long-forgotten hurt child experience forward, showing it the light of day, they are able to accept the sad reality of their childhood, let it go, and integrate it into their conscious mind. Such allows them to realize core self-love, a realistic, optimistic, and self-affirming definition of self which is based on what is naturally and fundamentally good about a person. This leads to existential peace, the polar opposite of pathological loneliness. For the first time, the newly self-loving person feels comfortable in their own skin. Free from shame and loneliness, this person can then find and demand mutuality and reciprocity in all of their relationships. The new relationship rules require self-love, self-respect, and self-care, which engenders the same in others. The culmination of these achievements results in self-love, the serenity and acceptance of one's place in the world. 
Being perfect despite one's problems is the foundation for future loving relationships with self and with others. So there's a point in our recovery when you overcome the trauma and you start, you're open to loving yourself and you start building that. And that's, that's what the codependent, the SLD never learned. And that is the beginning of the end of what we know as codependency. You can't go back because once you taste it, you don't want ever, anyone to take it away from you again. That's why I'm calling it a cure, not a recovery. I love that. And I love how you put it in that positive way. You know, I, the word codependency, it just sounds so like almost like you, you surrender to like that destiny and then like what that's always going to be defining you for as long as you live. So I love the way that you put that into a very positive spin too with the abundance of self-love. There is a transition. Um, somewhere along the line in, um, in my stages, um, that there's a point of time where it just naturally feels right when you start to love yourself. So I, I, I love this topic and um, I can talk all day about it. Thank you so much, Ross, for taking the time to do this interview today and for sharing your information with everybody else. So, so grateful. Thank you and namaste. This, this was a wonderful treat for me to uh, um, talk with you, uh, a person who was just a smiling face who on a video who just seemed really smart and they have a conversation. Um, I, I love it. Right. So let's do it again. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ross. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye.